promised, um, this week we're finally going to reset from our focus on complicated mathematics um, and go back to really easy mathematics in support of algorithmic thinking. Um, we sort of uh, maxed out on, on mathematical complexity and uh, are now going to be taking it easy for a while. Uh, we're going to be looking at a new topic. which is approximation algorithms. And so as I uh, intimated last time, what we're going to be looking at is problems that, uh, for one reason or another, we don't uh, have the ability to solve exactly. Uh, many of the problems that we're going to be looking at are going to be NP-complete problems. Uh, and these are problems for which we have a strong reason to believe that it is not possible to solve them exactly in polynomial time. But actually, some of what I'm going to be talking about, the sort of principles and such, also applies when it is possible to solve a problem in polynomial time, but you just can't be bothered. Um, it, it takes too long. It, getting the answer exactly right is not that important. Um, but, uh, but as I said, the focus is going to be on, um, on these uh, problems that, that tend to be intractable. So if you're faced with an intractable problem where you don't have any hope of coming up with the correct answer, um, what sort of uh, approaches might you take? Well. Um, uh, so actually, let me sort of list some alternatives before we dive into approximation algorithms. Um, one is to look at uh, sort of expected performance. So there's a lot of work looking at problems which says that while this problem may be difficult in the worst case, on average, it's easy. If I give you a random input, a ra random problem instance, then it's easy to solve. So, you know, Hamiltonian path problem is NP complete. But if I ask you to find a Hamiltonian path in a random graph, then it's pretty easy uh, for the most part. So you can, you can almost always do so with high probability. And so, so the average time that it takes to find a path, uh, or average overall graphs, is polynomial. Um, so, as I said, there's a nice line of work on this. Uh, there's a, the problem of agreeing on what you're averaging over, right? So what is the probability distribution over problem instances? And in, in a certain sense, the whole, um, the whole uh, argument of, of this line of approach is, here, I've given you a distribution which focuses all of the weight on the easy problems, right? So you can say, that's interesting. That's a good way to understand the easy problems. Or you can say, well, that's not interesting because you left out all the hard problems. Um, another approach is uh, to look at super polynomial algorithms, or hopefully not two super polynomial algorithms. All right, and uh, depending on how much time I have, we may look at a little bit of that uh, th this, uh, in, in this class. Um, uh, another is to um, look at um, uh, practice, right? So you can use techniques like branch and bound uh, to solve all sorts of problems in practice that from a theoretician's perspective are too hard to solve, right? So um, it's, you know, unfortunate when you're in that situation because the theory doesn't give you any guidance about whether you're going to be able to solve the problem or not. You just need to try things and see. But there are a lot of times where it does work. Um, but what we're going to focus on is um, is we're going to look for a polynomial time algorithm um, that does well that, that finds a pretty good solution. All right, so I have to formalize some of that a little bit. So here are some definitions. We're going to be looking at optimization problems. So it doesn't make much sense to talk about an approximation if you're doing a decision problem with a yes or no answer. Right, I suppose you could have a factor of two approximation by saying, well, yes or no. <laughs> um, but uh, 
Um, the op optimization problem is going to have um, some instances, uh, which I can denote by i, um, a set of solutions to each instance, uh, feasible solutions, that is, s um, uh, that, that maps each uh, particular input instance to a set of candidate solutions. Um, and each of the solutions uh, are mapped by some value function into the reals. Okay. And our optimization problem is going to be given i. Uh, you want to find some solution uh, s element of the solution space of i uh, that maximizes or minimizes uh, the value of that solution. Okay, and this will be called the optimum of i. Right. So that's sort of the general framework, um, just to just to give us some labels for things. Um, so just to start getting some examples on the table, we're going to be looking at a lot of examples of these hard to solve problems uh, today. Um, a famous one is bin packing. So in bin packing, um, a, an instance i is a set uh, of items, each with a size. And a feasible solution um, is to partition those items into what are called bins uh, of total size at most one. Okay. And then the value of a solution um, is just the number of bins. So this is asking, you know, given all the stuff that you have to pack away for the winter, how many boxes do you actually need uh, to, to get it all put away? Okay. Now, we're going to make a number of sort of standard technical assumptions uh, so that I can, don't have to keep making them over and over again. Um, we're going to assume that all of the inputs and the range of f are uh, integers or rationals. None of that real number nonsense. Um, and that means that we can immediately start invoking things like linear programming, binary search, uh, and not worry about them running infinitely long. Um, and uh, we're also going to assume that the value of any solution um, has a polynomial number of bits, since otherwise it's going to just take us too long to write the answer down. And uh, we will be willing to be weakly polynomial uh, so we can have a runtime that depends on the bit complexity of the input. So I'm not going to draw strong distinctions between uh, strong and weak polynomiality uh, yet. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, we're going to be looking at NP-hard problems for the most part. Now, uh, yes? Um, you say sigma has polynomial number of bits. Is sigma any element of um, i, or is it only the optimum that we require to <laughs> For everything that we do, it's going to be every element of every, every member of i. Um, some of what we do probably doesn't care if there are insane solutions with a huge number of bits, but it's not going to come up for us. Um, so I assume that everybody here has run into NP hardness and NP completeness before. I won't spend a lot of time on it. I will just note that um, uh, usually when you're doing NP completeness, uh, you talk about decision problems, right? Is this a yes or a no? And you do reductions between different decision problems in order to uh, um, uh, show things that are NP show things that are NP complete, um, but uh, 
it's, the, it's sort of pretty natural to transform uh, all sorts of optimization problems into uh, decision problems. So uh, for example, you can transform via a decision if the optimum solution is less than or equal to some value k. Right? So given any optimization problem, there's an analogous decision problem. And uh, we say that the optimization problem is uh, NP-hard if the decision problem is uh, NP-hard. Right? Because obviously, if you were able to solve the optimization problem, you could use that to solve the decision problem. So the optimization problem is at least as hard. Okay. Um, so now that we've got all those definitions down, we can define the most important definition for this section, which is we get to define an approximation algorithm. So what do you suppose is an example, uh, is, is a good definition for an approximation algorithm? We've got to cover a lot of possibilities here. So how about this? An algorithm that gives a feasible solution. That's an approximation algorithm. Okay. Well, I mean, if we want to cover everything, we really don't have any other choice. Right? I mean, we can certainly demand feasibility of our algorithm, but uh, in some sense, it's an approximation. Right? Any feasible solution is an approximation of some sort. Right? So what would be an approximation algorithm for bin packing that you could figure out pretty quickly? What was that? The number of items. So that would be the value of a solution that you could find using this approximation algorithm. What would the algorithm be? Put, put every item in its own bin. Okay? That's an approximation algorithm. Right? Of course, uh, we want a good approximation algorithm. Right? So the big question becomes, how do we measure the quality of an approximation algorithm? And of course, we're going to measure the quality of an approximation algorithm by looking at the quality of the answers that it gives. So really what we're asking is, how do we measure the quality of an answer to an algorithmic problem? Okay. Who, who gets to define close? So the first approach we're going to take um, is pretty natural. Uh, we're going to talk about absolute approximations. So an absolute approximation, uh, we say um, an algorithm A is a k-absolute approximation algorithm if for all instances i, uh, the absolute value of what my algorithm finds on instance i minus the optimum on instance i is less than or equal to k. Definition clear? Right, so we're basically saying it has to be within some additive factor of the optimum uh, solution on every possible instance. Okay. Now there are some problems for which there are absolute approximation algorithms. So for example, uh, there's planar graph coloring. So planar graph coloring says, given a graph which can be drawn in the plane without any edges crossing it, okay, or pretty much equivalently, given a map, okay, you want to assign a color to every vertex, equivalently country, uh, such that no two adjacent vertices slash countries get the same color. Okay, so this is the graph coloring problem, is to sort of uh, make sure that no edge has endpoints that are the same color on it. Okay. And uh, this is NP-hard, even in the planar graph case. Okay. However, we can get an absolute approximation algorithm for this problem. Does anybody know why? Yeah? Any graph can be colored using four colors. Exactly. 
So there's this four color theorem, which says that any graph can be any planar graph can be colored using four colors. Well, that clearly gives us a four absolute approximation, right? Actually, it gives us a three absolute approximation because you're going to have to use at least one color. Would anybody like to squeeze down to a two absolute approximation? How could we, how could we get a two absolute approximation? Any thoughts? Yeah? Um, if they're connected by an edge, good. So what we can do is we can check if there are any edges in the graph at all, right? Um, if there are no edges, then we color the graph perfectly. So that gives us a perfect approximation, right? Uh, um, zero absolute. On the other hand, if there is at least an edge in a graph, well, then we know that the graph needs at least two colors, right? And uh, that means that we're now at a two absolute approximation. Would anybody like to fight down to a one absolute approximation? Yes? If there is an odd cycle. Odd, so, so what do odd cycles have to do with graph coloring? You're, you're absolutely right, but what's, what's the connection? Uh, because like when you have, what was that? If you have an odd, odd cycle, you can't like cover, you can't use like only two covers, you need at least. Absolutely two right. Colors. So there's this, uh, this famous result that if you have an odd cycle in the graph, there's no way to use just two colors to, uh, to color the vertices of that graph, right? Because you're going to have to alternate along the cycle, and when you get back, you're going to want to use the same colors you started with, and you can't because it's next to your starting point, so you're going to have to introduce the third color at that point. So any time you have an odd cycle, you have to use three colors. Um, is the converse true? If there are no odd cycles in the graph, can you color it with two colors? Yeah? Exactly. So in fact, a, a, sort of a theorem about uh, graphs is that if there are no odd cycles, then the graph is bipartite. You can, you can see that. You can, you can find the bipartition just by breadth-first search, right? Because the breadth-first search can't have any odd cycles in it, so it's going, to distinct, it's going to determine which side every vertex goes on. Uh, without any confusion. So you'll end up with two sides of the graph and all the edges crossing between them, so you use one color for each side. So if the graph is bipartite, we can color it optimally with two colors. If, on the other hand, it's not bipartite, that means it has an odd cycle, that means we need at least three. So in fact, um, that leads to a, um, that says that if we colored with four colors, we would have a one absolute approximation, right? Which is, of course, the best you can hope for, okay? Um, although I have, to, I have to admit, I can't remember whether the four color theorem is constructive. It may be exist I think it's existential. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to color a graph with five colors uh, if it's a planar graph. So using this fact about three colorability, we know that we can get a two approximation by five coloring the graph in a sort of a greedy fashion. Um, there's a similar result for edge coloring. Um, So edge coloring is a variation on the graph coloring uh, problem, where instead of coloring the vertices, you want to color the edges of the graph. And no two edges that share a vertex are allowed to have the same uh, color. Okay. And uh, it's for similar reasons. Uh, there's this famous theorem of Vising, uh, which says that uh, obviously you have to have at least delta colors. Um, but at most, delta plus one colors suffice. So you can get a one absolute approximation for Vising's theorem, uh, fr from Vising's theorem. Okay. So, so far so good. We've gotten a definition of an approximation algorithm. We've given some examples of um, what it can do. Unfortunately, this doesn't take us very far. Absolute approximations are very rare, and they tend to show up only, on, only for trivial reasons like these, where the answer is always a constant. And so you can always figure out what the answer is. And there's a reason for that. Uh, sorry, did you have a question? Ah, so it's a very interesting question. So there is this interesting distinction between finding the value of the solution versus constructing the solution, right? 
there's a very broad class of problems, pr I think all of the problems that we're going to be looking at, where that distinction can be eliminated through something known as self-reducibility. So it, there is a large class of problems where if you have somebody who will tell you the value of any problem instance, you can construct the solution by basically peeling off uh, bits of the problem in a way that's guided by the values that they're giving you. Okay? But there is certainly a distinction to be drawn in, in complexity theory. I doubt that you can always go from one to the other. Um, so uh, what goes wrong? What, so uh, what I'm going to show you is ways to disprove the existence of an absolute approximation, a way to show that this particular problem there ha has no absolute approximation. And they're very general ways. They almost always work. So you basically almost never have a problem with an absolute approximation. Um, so often, uh, there is no absolute approximation. And what's the reason? Well, let's do it by example. Let's look at another classic NP-hard problem called knapsack. So after you've packed everything away for the winter, you want to go camping one last time uh, before the weather turns bad. Uh, see the beautiful leaves in Vermont. So you've got all this stuff that you would like to take with you. Um, and there's different utility, you know, well, food's pretty important, uh, soap kind of matters, television maybe not so much. Um, so you have a decision to make about what to bring with you in order to maximize the overall utility of your uh, camping trip. So um, you have a set of items uh, which have sizes, SI, and each of which comes with a profit, PI. Um, and you have a knapsack si a, a, nap a single knapsack of size B. And your goal is to fill it uh, with the max profit items that fit. OK? Pretty natural problem. Problem statement clear? All right. So suppose that there exists a k-absolute solution. I want to arrive at a contradiction. Oh, and I should s tell you that this problem is, again, NP-hard. So we do not believe that there is a polynomial time solution having one would prove p equals NP. So what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to take this k absolute uh, approximation algorithm. And I'm going to use it to solve the problem exactly. Okay. And the trick is to recognize that, uh, in a sense, a, the notion of a k absolute approximation imposes a scale, imposes units that are not present in the algorithm. And so we can cheat on the units uh, that we're using in the algorithm. Okay. Does anybody see a way towards that? Yes, Oren. Uh, hello. Scale up all the profits, so they're. Yeah. Like so notice that if I take this problem and I just multiply the, all the profits by a huge number, okay, I haven't really changed the problem at all, right? But what does it do to my uh, k absolute approximation? Yeah? It increases the accuracy of the fraction of the. Yeah, I mean, if I multiply up all the sizes, then all of the solutions multiply in size. And so, like, the second best solution gets much farther away from the, from the best solution than it was before. And I can easily do the scaling to push it outside of the bounds of uh, k approximation. So, in particular, um, I'm going to multiply all of the pi by k plus 1. Um, and I'm going to assume without loss of generality that I'm starting with integers so that this argument is nice and clean, right? I, again, if I have rationals for my profits, I can multiply out all of the denominators and work with the integer version of the problem. So um, I start with integers. Now I'm going to multiply them all by k plus 1, right? Um, 
And so now what do I argue? Well, um, I have some, optim I have some uh, uh, my solution, right? So my algorithmic solution is going to have value at least, I'm lower bounding it because it's an approximation, it's going to be worse than the, than the optimum, so it's going to be a little bit smaller. But it is at least um, the optimum uh, solution minus Okay, right? But now, I'm, but, but, but now I'm going to multiply everything by k plus 1. So the value of my algorithm solution is going to get multiplied up by k plus 1. The value of the optimum is also going to get multiplied up by uh, k plus 1, right? So now if I divide all of this out, I find out that in fact, the value of my algorithmic solution is at least uh, opt of i minus k over k plus 1. So now who wants to finish the argument for me? Yeah? Because the, these are integer values. And the, the, That's the key, right? These are both integers. And this integer is smaller than this one, but not smaller by, but, but smaller by less than one. Or sorry, it, it's not bigger, but it also can't be one smaller. So in fact, these are equal, right? All right, so any problem that has this kind of scalability, this sort of uh, flexibility in the units in which you specify the uh, input numbers is not going to be able to have an absolute approximation algorithm. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so this, this, exactly the same proof works. It's just a little bit easier. It's just a little bit cleaner to write down if I cast out the denominators first instead of doing so in the course of proving the, the algorithm. Okay. All right. Um, now, so this works for any numeric problem, but it even works for problems without any numbers in them. So here's another example, clique. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me do independent set. Clique is messier in this. Um, running ahead of myself. Maximum independent set. Finding an independent set is pretty easy. So this is one of the granddaddy problems of uh, computer science. People have been working on this one for, for, for 50 years, I think. Um, you're given a graph G and an independent set is a collection of vertices with no connecting edges. So for every pair of vertices in this set, there is, there is no edge connecting them. Okay. Um, I'll mention that the complement problem, if you just look in the, in the complement graph, um, is the clique problem. A clique is talking about a set of vertices where every pair is connected by an edge. Okay. Um, and so independent sets, well, they, they show up all over the place. Um, and, uh, the, in terms of, I, I don't even need to go into it. There's, there's too many examples. Um, but uh, finding one that's as large as possible is a, is a natural challenge. Okay. Um, but this also is NP-hard. Um, there are no numbers here. What can we amplify? in order to argue that there is no k, k absolute approximation to the maximum independent set. Yeah? You can just like, blow up every node into like, k plus 1 nodes. Good. So the idea is to make copies of the graph, right? So suppose you have a k plus 1, suppose you have a k absolute approximation. Make k plus 1 copies of g. Find your k absolute approximation. Okay. 
Now, how do I, how do I complete the argument? I, want to, I need to understand what happens to the optimum when I make k plus 1 copies of g, and also what happens to my approximation algorithm. Okay. Yeah? So the largest uh, independent set on this copy of graph is just of size. It's just you can put some copies of the maximum independent set on g. But if you have a k approximate, then that means one of them, on one of these copies, must be the same as the maximum. Good. So first thing I can argue is the, that the optimum on k plus 1 copies of g is at least k plus 1 times the optimum of g. Why is that? Yeah? Well, what, 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 how, do I ex how do I exhibit a solution that has this value? Take the independent set in every copy. So now I have k plus 1 times as many vertices, right? Um, so now I find a solution. Uh, a value at least uh, k plus 1 times the opt of g minus k, right, in this expanded out graph. Now what can I do with that solution? How can I arrive at a contradiction? Or how, how can I solve the original problem? I've got this big independent set in the copies, but how do I solve the original problem? Yeah? You can look at the subset or look at the intersection of one copies. Yes. And that has that size greater than uh, one thousand or one. Exactly. So the point is that in some copy, right, I have to sort of spread I have to spread the solution out over the different copies. But in some copy, I have at least uh, k plus one times opt of g minus k divided by k plus 1, right? Something, something has to be at least average, right? Which is at least uh, opt of g minus k over k plus 1, which again, opt of g is an integer. This is smaller than 1. Therefore, my solution has the same value as the optimum solution, and we're done. We found the optimum just by this simple scaling trick. Okay. So what this tells us is that with absolute approximations, we're not going to get very far. Um, I should say that although I've shown you um, the sort of absolute approximation hardness for these two separate problems, their, their true hardnesses are totally different. Um, knapsack turns out to be incredibly easy to approximate, and independent set turns out to be incredibly hard to approximate. Um, and we'll sort of understand that a little better as we proceed. So if absolute approximations are not going to get us anywhere, What's the next best choice for describing the quality of an approximation algorithm? Well, what people have settled on is relative approximations. Okay. So um, given some instance of a problem, um, we're going to say that an alpha optimum solution Uh, to an instance is uh, one with value um, at most alpha times the optimum if you have a uh, minimization problem or at least 1 over alpha times the optimum if you have a maximization problem. Okay. Um, so notice that alpha is bigger than 1 in either case. right? There's no way you can do better than the minimum. You can't be, you can't be smaller than the minimum, so alpha is going to be bigger than 1 for a minimum. And you can't be larger than the maximum, so alpha is going to be bigger than 1 for the maximum. So alpha is always greater than 1 here. And um, we say an algorithm has approximation ratio alpha if um, it always outputs an alpha op optimum solution. OK. 
Um, and it's, it's called an alpha approximation algorithm. Now I should say that I've defined it to make alpha always bigger than one, but some people define it to make alpha always less than one. Uh, and it's always clear what you're talking about, right? If you see a number that's smaller than one and you have a minimization problem, then you know you have to turn the ratio upside down in order for it to make any, make any sense. And ditto for maximization. So I will generally be stating my approximation ratios as numbers greater than one according to this definition, but some of the really famous ones have ratios smaller than one and you'll just know that you should invert them uh, when, if you want to fit these definitions. Okay. And so we're going to be spending all of our time uh, on approximation algorithms talking about relative approximations. So now things get kind of interesting. Uh, how do we prove uh, relative approximations? So we've already been talking about this a little bit with the absolute approximations, but now I'm going to make it explicit. There is this interesting problem if you want it with, with proving that your algorithm is an approximation algorithm. The problem is that the most obvious way to do that is to compare your solution to the correct solution. But we don't have it. Right? So how can we hope to prove that we are close to the optimum solution if we don't actually have the optimum solution to compare to? Yeah? Maybe like at every step you get like a fraction of the way that... Uh, ah, so that, 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 talking about, how do we talk about getting a fraction of the way there if we don't know the value of the optimum? Um, you could say that no matter what, like this operation like, can only do this much. And in this case it only does like half Good. So what you're implicitly talking about is uh, bounding what could happen, even in the optimum case. Right? And that is, in fact, what we need to do. Um, we need to compare our solution to various upper or lower bounds on the optimum. Right? And so this is where a lot of the work is going to be, is coming up with a good bound on the optimum and then showing that we, then it's going to, often going to be easy to show that we're close to that good bound. And that will tell us that the, optim the optimum itself is somewhere in between our solution and the bound that we found, and therefore we must be close to optimum. General approach clear? OK. So now that we've got a general approach, um, let's start doing some, uh, some algorithms. Uh, actually, so the first class of algorithms that we're going to look at is uh, greedy algorithms. There are quite a few places where greedy algorithms do great. Um, and again, the, the trick, it's, it's, it's usually obvious what the greedy algorithm is. The trick is showing that it does well. And the way that you show it does well is by comparing it against um, some useful bound. Okay? Uh, so the algorithm tends to be obvious. Uh, the trick is to find a good bound to compare it to. So let's start doing that. So introducing another uh, fun problem, we've got max cut. So we've done a lot with min cut, right? Take this graph, separate it into two pieces, minimize the number of edges that cross. Well, what happens if you turn it around and say that instead you wish to maximize the number of edges that cross? Well, it turns out that makes it NP hard. Um, so let's come up with a greedy algorithm for it. So what would be a greedy way to build a cut that has as many edges as possible crossing the two sides? Yeah? You would find the edge of the max capacity. Ah, so let's not, let's not make our lives difficult with capacities. Let's just think about a, a unit capacities graph. Okay. And again, we, so the, the, the idea of a greedy algorithm is generally that you build it a little bit at a time. 
right? So what's the, little, what's the natural little bit at a time for dealing with a cut? Well, let's start putting the, cut, the vertices down one after another. So what's the greedy thing to do when you're building this cut? Yeah? Uh, and put them where? Right? The decision point is which side of the graph should they go, of, of this cut that you're creating should they go? So I can start with a high degree, but I still need to decide where to put it. Yeah? You can just look at all the neighbors who have already put the put and then pick the side that has. Here. Great. So for each vertex, and it's going to turn out that looking at high degree doesn't make any difference for this analysis. For each vertex, um, put the opposite, put it opposite the majority of its placed neighbors. So the first vertex can go anywhere. The second vertex, well, if it has that first vertex as a neighbor, it's going to go on the opposite side. Otherwise, it can go anywhere. And you just keep on putting vertices one at a time so that they're opposite the majority of the, of the place neighbors. Do you have a question? What did you say the modification is? Oh, that we're looking at max instead of min. Oh. That's it. Just, change, just flipping the objective function around. Uh, and this is not unusual. There are many problems where maximization is trivial and minimization is hard, uh, or vice versa. Okay. Yes? It seems like this isn't entirely well defined since you have some choice whenever you don't have any neighbors. So yes, and the point is that either choice is fine. So if, if instead of saying majority, I say non-minority, right? As, as long as you don't put it on the, on the worst side, uh, the analysis that I'm going to perform uh, is going to go through just fine. Okay. So how do we analyze this? Well, as I said, we need a bound. Sorry, did you have a question or a proposal for it. Okay, so we need a bound, right? So what sort of bound can we uh, aim at if we're talking about the max cut on an unweighted graph? Yeah? Yeah, in an unweighted graph, that's just m, right? One, one per edge, right? So we can, always, we can clearly say that there's an upper bound of m. And the question is, can we argue that this greedy algorithm somehow gets some of that upper, it gets close to that upper bound? Yeah? For each vertex, you put at least half of its edges in the cut. Good. So, or edges coming out of the cut. So right, so we have to be a little bit careful because some of the edges coming out of it go to a vertex that hasn't been placed yet. Right? So when we place the vertex, some of its neighbors are on one side or the other, but some of its neighbors are not, haven't had their turn yet. So, but you're absolutely right that of the vertices that have been placed, right, at least half of them are on the opposite side, right? So um, that's the key to the analysis, right? Of the placed neighbors, at least half are on the opposite side. So how do I go from that observation to a full analysis? Yeah. Now you should look at the unplaced neighbors. What was that? Now you should look at the neighbors that you haven't placed yet in relation to what you've already placed. Okay. Can we can we add some? Can we clarify that some? So, so yes, I've placed some, and I've got some more to place, but. How do, I, how do I compare what's happening to what could be happening? Yeah? yeah for any edge that's not in the cut, like when you place, when you made that edge, you must have also made another edge. Great. So that's a very sort of elegant amortization argument, right? So essentially, at each step, you're placing a vertex and you're creating some cut edges and some uncut edges, right? And the point is that at each step, you create at least as many cut edges as uncut edges. So the total number of cut edges that you create is then at least as many as the total number of uncut edges that you create over the course of the entire algorithm, right? So at each step, I create more cut edges than uncut. And that tells me that at the end of the algorithm, I have more uncut edges, more cut edges than uncut. 
Translating that, that tells me that at least half of the edges are cut. Right? Which means that I have a two approximation. Right? Just comparing against the elementary bound of m edges. So any questions about that uh, algorithm? It's the first non-trivial analysis we've done today, so good time for questions. Yes? Um, only this. You said the two approximation. You can show that it's a two approximation. Is it better than that? No. <laughs> so you can construct instances where this only achieves two. And in fact, for decades, two was the best known approximation for this problem. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to be wrestling with over the next few lectures is how do you know if it's possible to do better? Right? Um, you know, should we say, hooray, two approximation, we're done? Or should we keep on, uh, keep on trying? And for a long time, people didn't get anywhere with this uh, problem. In 1995, um, Michel Gomans, math department, and one of his students uh, came up with a to like an amazing new approach that sort of revolutionized uh, approximation algorithms. And um, that gave a 0.878 approximation. So you have to invert that in order to put it into my framework. But they, they used less than one. Uh, ratios, uh, which was significantly better. And um, that used a generalization of linear programming to come up with a far superior uh, bound on the optimum solution that they could compare to and, and show that they were doing much better. Okay? And uh, if you want to see that, you need to take my randomized algorithms class uh, a year from now. Yes. Wait, so the, the algorithm itself is the same, and they just found No, they, found they came up, no, no. They, oh. they, use, they, they, they use this generalization of linear programming to, to define a, uh, a problem that can be solved, but that is a better lower, that, has, that is tighter than this sort of all of the edges uh, bound. And we'll, we'll see some of the principles of it uh, in this class. So I can say more about that in a week um, after we study uh, LP relaxations. Um, OK, let's look at another one. Um, OK, this one is fun. Let's do set cover. So one of the things that's fun about this is that besides sort of you know, introducing all these techniques, you're getting kind of the grand tour of all the problems that people work on in, out, in approximation algorithms. Because they're all very natural problems, very general, very abstract. They apply in lots of places. So it's good to know what they are and to sort of understand what people know about their approximations. So set cover. Uh, so here, you are given a collection of n items. Okay. And you have a collection of m sets. Okay. Um, and your goal is to find a smallest uh, collection of sets that covers all the items. Okay. In other words, you want to find a collection of these sets whose union is the entire collection of n items. Okay. Yes, question? Ah, so yes, so that, that's exactly where I want to go. Um, what's the natural greedy algorithm? Do you have a proposal? Well, yeah, just take the set that covers the most items and then take the set that covers the most of the remaining items. Good. So we're just going to repeat until done. We are going to take the set that covers the most uncovered items. Nothing really more obvious than that, right? Just at each step, we do the best possible thing. The trick here is the analysis, right? Uh, that, that's where all the work always is. So um, suppose that the optimum has value k. It's possible to cover all of the items with k sets. Can we argue anything about the progress that we can make by choosing the set that covers the most remaining items.
Yeah? Well, we'll cover at least one new thing because we wouldn't choose it if it wasn't covering at least one new item. Okay, so we cover at least one new item. So that's going to lead to an n approximation, right? Because in the worst case, maybe k is 1, but uh, we're taking n sets to do the cover. So can we argue something stronger? Um, I mean, let, let's consider some, uh, some simple examples. Suppose that k is equal to 1, right? There's, there's a set that ha there is a set that has all the items in it. What's going to happen, right? Well, we're going to take that right away because obviously it covers the most items, right? What if, like, what, what if k is 2? Can we say something about how much we're going to accomplish by taking one set? Uh, yeah? We cover, with the first set, we cover at least n over k of the items. Good. So if the optimum is k and there are n items to be covered, then one of the optimum sets covers n over k of the items, right? Okay, that's very nice for the first step, but can we say anything about later steps? Right. Suppose that there are r items left. We have r uncovered items. What can we conclude about our progress? Yeah? That's absolutely right. So notice that op doesn't disappear. Right? Those k optimum sets are always available. I mean, we, we might take them. That can only help us um, if we're sort of doing the same thing as opt. But there are always, at most k sets, right? whatever we haven't taken from opt, there's at most k sets that cover everything that's left. That means that there is some set that covers a 1 over k fraction of what's left. Right? Okay. So, that what that tells us is that in general, one step takes us from r to r minus r over k, which is 1 minus 1 over k times r. So I decrease the amount of items to be, that need to still be covered by a 1 minus 1 over k factor in every step. So how long is it going to take me to cover everything? Well, after t steps, I claim I'm going to have at most 1 minus 1 over k to the t times n items uh, uncovered. Right? So how many steps do I need to take to cover everything? So what happens if I take k steps? Well, then I'm going to have 1 minus 1 over k to the k times n items. What's 1 minus 1 over k to the k? That's about 1 over e, right? So n over e items. So that's not quite enough. Right? But I have taken it down by a constant factor. What do I have to do to get it all the way down? What sort of, what's, a good, what's a termination condition? Yeah, when this quantity, 1 minus 1 over k to the, to the t times n, if that's less than 1, it means I have less than one item to cover. Items are integers, so I have zero items at that point. So I need 1 minus 1 over k to the t n to be less than 1. Right? And that happens at uh, t equal k times the natural law or order k times log of n. It's basically at k log, k log n, but I don't want to be too careful. Uh, okay. So what have we just shown? Well, we started just with the assumption that the optimum is k. And we found that we get a solution which has value k log n. In other words, we have a log n approximation. Okay. Uh, again, looking forward a little bit, set cover is a really one, one of the celebrated problems that people have worked on approximating. 
And this turns out to be the best you can do. There are, there are strong theorems that basically tell us that we are not going to be able to approximate set cover to within better than a factor of k log n. And in fact, it, it's k times the natural log of n, and you're not even going to be able to bring the constant down further uh, than, than k times the natural log of n. Yes? So did you assume that we can't solve it exactly? You, well, yeah, so pretty much everything in hardness, like when I, when I state that things can't be done, this is all under the assumption that p is not equal to np. So pretty much, so all of these things that I'm saying that you can't approximate this, you can't beat this factor, so on and so forth, it's saying assuming p equals not np, or, or, or in other words, if you are able to do any of those things, then you will have um, won a million dollars by showing that p is equal to np. Okay. Oh, so we, we can if we choose to, right? So um, since we have something here that is not constant, right, that's growing with n, it becomes less of an issue to ask exactly what the constant is. But um, as I just said, people care a lot about set cover, and they have asked that question. And I believe that the results are very strong, that it's k times the natural log of n and no smaller. Okay, so I think they've even managed to, to kill the constant term. Yes? Is there some moral distinction between these um, approximations that are constants, like the true approximation, and these approximations that depend on the um, input, like the log n? Absolutely. Right. So, I, I mean, pragmatically, it's very nice to have an approximation factor that does not depend, that does not grow with the size of your, of your input or the size of your solution. Um, and we're going to be spending a bunch of time trying to differentiate between those different layers of approximation. Uh, so we'll, 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 we'll be seeing that again over the next uh, couple of lectures. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Uh, oh, so here's another fun one. Uh, actually, let's take a two-minute break, and then we'll do a couple more before class ends. So the next problem we're going to look at is vertex cover. Okay. So this is a kind of a natural variant on uh, set cover um, where you want to cover the edges of a graph G using the minimum number of vertices. Now, what do I mean by covering the edges? Uh, so a, an edge is covered if you take either of its endpoints. Okay, so I want, I want to find a set of vertices that includes an endpoint of every edge in the graph. Okay. So how might I go about solving this problem? Well, one thing I could do is try and apply a problem that I already know how to solve. All right, so is there a problem that we already know how to solve? Perhaps one that we have solved quite recently that we could use in order to solve vertex cover. Boy, people forget fast. Right? Uh, yeah? Independent set cover? Uh, so, ah, OK, so that's a, that's a very interesting statement. So it, if you think about it, a vertex cover, right, that has one endpoint on every edge. So if you take the complement of the vertex cover, the, the uh, vertices that are not in the vertex cover, they have to form an independent set. Because right? if there's an edge between any two of them, then it's not covered. Okay? So there's this very nice dual relationship between vertex covers and independent sets. Unfortunately, that dual relationship does not extend to approximation. Okay? We have no idea how to approximate independent set. So that is not a good avenue towards approximating vertex cover. Uh, yes? <coughs> set cover. So how could I solve vertex cover using set cover? Well, I can think of each vertex, right? Uh, covers a set of edges, right? So that seems to be a pretty straightforward uh, mapping, right? I, I can use the greedy algorithm, just keep taking vertices that cover as many edges as possible and I will get a log n approximation. Okay. So that does work, but actually, you know, vertex cover is a very special kind of set cover problem. Right? It has this interesting characteristic that each item is only in two sets. And so 
uh, not completely surprisingly, we can do better because we have a special case uh, version of the problem. Okay? So we're going to be greedy, um, but we're going to be actually, we're going to be super greedy. And that's going to take us to a better solution. So what's the greedy algorithm, right? Find some edges that need to be covered, take a vertex that covers the edges, right? But actually, we're going to overdo it. When we find that edge that needs to be covered, we're actually going to take both edges, both endpoints of the edge. OK? So repeat. Find an uncovered vertex. Take both ends into the cover. Uh, what was that? Uh, yes, thank you. Uncovered, uncovered edge. And take both vertices, both endpoints, into the cover. Now that seems silly. Why are we going over the top greedy here? when we could just cover the, the edge with one of the endpoints. Well, there's something that's very nice that's guaranteed by our taking both of the endpoints. So what, what could that be? What's the benefit of taking both? Yeah? There will then be no case in which you take a new uh, vertex that covers an old edge, or is covered by an old edge. We'll never, uh, well, so we don't talk about vertices being covered by edges, right? It's the other way around. Um, but but uh, you're, you're right. If I, if I take a vertex in the future, it's because it's needed for some edge um, that was not uh, covered yet. But, but that's always true. Well, it is as greedy as possible, but that doesn't mean, I, I, I want to be clear, that doesn't mean quite what you're, what you're implying. Because um, if I have uh, a situation like this, um, if I take this, uh, see what's a good example. Yeah, if I take, the, if I take, um, if I decide to cover this edge, um, I'm going to cover up all of. I'm, I'm going to take both endpoints of it, and I'm going to take away all of these edges. But this vertex um, is still going to have some other edges incident on it. I'm not sort of going to magically take care of all of the edges incident on my, on my neighbors just because I took both endpoints. Okay, but I am going to accomplish something nice. So think about the optimum. OK, so here's an uncovered edge. Here's an edge in the graph. What do I know about the optimum? Just because this edge is here. Yeah? Um, so it either includes one or both. Of right. So if I see an edge, I know that the optimum has to have one of the two endpoints of the edge. So what is the benefit of taking both endpoints? Yeah? Because? Because at every step, you take one from the optimum. Exactly, right? So this removes, so, so at, each, at each step, this removes one optimum vertex. Right? So if I have this procedure that takes out one of the optimum vertices in every iteration, that tells me that the number of steps is less than opt, which tells me that my solution, which takes two vertices on every step, is less than twice opt. Okay. So special case of set cover problem with a much nicer, uh, with, with a much nicer bound. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Less than equal. And there are cases when it is equal. So I don't really see how this connects to the greedy algorithm. Okay. Here we took the maximum degree vertex and deleted it. And also yes. So, so right. So this is greedy in a different way, right? This it doesn't matter which vertex, right? We we just take an edge and either end and both endpoints of that edge. We're not looking for high degree or anything like that. The greed is just look find some uncovered edge and fix it. Right? It's, a, it's a very um, sloppy uh, kind of greed, which just says, try to make forward progress. Yes? So doesn't this analysis apply even if you take all the vertices as your cover? Uh, no, because uh, if I have, for example, a star, what, 
what happens when I take all the vertices? Oh, that's not very good. What? Exactly. So it, you, can, you can also see this as just taking a maximal uh, set of vertices in a certain way. And you, what, what this shows is that any, any set that has that maximal characteristic is a, is a two approximation. OK? All right. One more uh, problem we'll look at, which I may need more than one board for. So I'll go back over here. So now I'm going to introduce you to this fun area called scheduling theory. So scheduling theory is a whole sub-branch of optimization, which deals with uh, scheduling jobs to be done. Um, and we're going to have n jobs uh, indexed by i on n machines uh, j. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's actually jobs j machines i. Uh, sorry, there's, th this is such a big field that like, they've decided what the notation is and better agree with them about what the notation is. Okay? Um, and what makes it a whole field is that there are so many different models of what kinds of machines and jobs you are uh, working with. Uh, there are so many that they had to invent a special notation just in order to describe which particular problem they were working on at a given time. Um, and if I have time after we do this problem, I will um, sort of flesh out the notation. But we are going to look at a problem where we have, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a problem from the class P, which means that we have M identical uh, parallel machines. And we want to optimize what's called C max, which is the maximum completion time Uh, of the jobs. Uh, so to flesh this out, we, get these, we have these n machines. They're all the same. We get these n jobs. Our goal is to assign each job to one of the machines so that it can be processed. Okay? Um, so each job has a processing time, pj. And the uh, processing time of a machine, right, or the, the, the completion time of a, of a job is equal to the sum uh, over all of the jobs preceding it uh, on the same machine, including yourself, of pj. So sort of the obvious thing, right? You, you, you assign these jobs to machines. You have to put them in some order on the machines. And they, they run one after another. And when the final one finishes, that's the completion time for the jobs on that machine. We want to minimize this max completion time. Okay? Now, an equivalent way to talk about this is as a load balancing problem. So instead of thinking about these as jobs that take a certain amount of processing time, uh, you could think of them as ongoing tasks that impose some load on the machine that they're running on. And so all of these tasks are running on the machine at the same time. And the total load that they impose is this quantity pj, okay? uh, is, is the sum of their pjs. And you want to minimize the maximum load imposed on any machine. So let's be greedy. Uh, but instead of calling it the greedy algorithm, I'm going to call it Graham's algorithm. <laughs> and that's because when Graham invented it, we hadn't yet defined greedy algorithm. Okay, so what's the natural greedy way to place these jobs onto machines? Again, the perspective is one at a time, right? Take the first job, put it somewhere. Then take the second job, put it somewhere. Where should we put each job as we're putting it down? Yes? Uh, place each job on a machine such that it will have the lowest completion 
Great. So place each job, or place the jobs in order, uh, arbitrary order, on the least loaded machine at the time of the placement. Yeah, uh, Graham's algorithm is from, I think, 1968 or 1969 or something like that. So again, before we actually thought of talking about greedy algorithms at all. So what's going to be interesting about Graham's algorithm is that we can't just talk about one lower bound in order to understand how well this algorithm does. We're going to have to talk about two distinct lower bounds uh, in order to argue that we do well. So. What sort of lower bounds can we look at? Given these processing times pj. Yeah? Good. So obviously, there's no way to do better than perfectly balancing the loads, right? If the jobs exactly evenly divide up over the machines, uh, then the average load is equal to the maximum load. And there's no way to do better than that, because some load always has to be bigger than the average. So how do we write that down? How, what, what formula do we use for that average load? Well, um, one over m times the sum of the pjs, right? Okay. So this seems like a, this is a very important lower bound to use, but it's not enough. Because there are cases where the average load is tiny, but there is still no good solution, right? If, if, if you can, if you're looking at some candidate lower bound, and you see an instance where the optimum is incredibly far away from that lower bound, then that tells you it's not a very good lower bound, right? Because if the optimum is very far away from the lower bound, you're not going to be able to prove that you can get close to the lower bound, right? Because even the optimum can't. And if you can't prove that you can get close to the lower bound, then you can't prove that you're close to optimum. So you need, you need your lower bounds to be always close to optimum. Yes? Uh, the max uh, PJ? Good. So the other lower bound that we need to think about is the maximum of the PJs. Why is that? Why? Why is it that the average load is not enough? What's, What's an instance? Yeah? Well, you could have one job that takes a long time and then, you know, a ton of machines, but you can't, you can only run that job on one machine. Exactly. So you need to worry about a job distribution like this um, that has one huge task. And so the optimum is far bigger than the average. Now, could we just look at max PJ and not worry about the average load? Yeah? You just have a ton of equally sized jobs. Yeah, so you need the other lower bound because you could have a situation with lots and lots of tiny, tiny jobs, right? So the maximum load is nothing. But once you have enough of them, uh, you're, you're dead. Right, you, your, 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 your average load is far bigger than your maximum load. So these two quantities are incomparable, and we need to engage both of them in order to prove a lower, in order to prove a good approximation for our greedy algorithm. Okay. So the main trick in the analysis is, um, let's consider the max load machine, the one that produces the quantity that is the value of our solution. Let's understand why it is the max load machine. So before the last job was added to it, or actually not before, when the last job was added to it, right? This is the sort of determining job, the one that kills, the, the one that defines our bound. What can we say about that machine when that job was added to it? Why did a job get added to that machine? Yeah? Less, uh, 
Right. So when the last job was added to it, it had the minimum load. Right? But that in particular means that it had less than or equal to the average load. Right? Which means that it had less than or equal to opt load. Right? I mean, and this is, it, it, it's, it was upper bounded by the average load at the time, but that, of course, is upper bounded by the final average load because we just keep tacking on machines, and that is upper bounded by opt according to one of our lower bounds. Right? So before we added this job, its load was less than opt. Now, what can we say about the added job? This last added job. How much could it add to this load that was less than opt? Yeah? The most it could add was the max PJ, which is also less than opt. Less than max PJ, which is less than or equal to opt. Put these together, and we find out that the max load is at most twice opt. Right? So the cleverness here is taking two lower bounds and putting them together. Okay? Now, you may be asking, why is it always two? Right? We've got all of these approximation algorithms, which it's always two. But actually here, we can do better. We, we, we can argue better. And it's just a couple of lines, so let me uh, throw it out to you. Um, in fact, um, we can argue like this. Where'd it go? Suppose that we added uh, PJ, again, we're looking at this last machine, uh, to a machine with load L to get Cmax. Okay. Well, in that case, the final average load, which is a lower bound on Cmax, is at least the previous average load plus what we've just stuck on. So it's L plus PJ over M. Right? And that, of course, is uh, less than or equal to opt. Because that's one of our valid lower bounds. We achieve. Um, L plus PJ. That's, that's exactly what we, what we do. But I can rewrite that as L plus PJ over M plus PJ times 1 minus 1 over M. Right? And this quantity is less than or equal to opt. And this quantity is less than or equal to opt. So our bound is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 over m times opt. Okay. So that's better than 2. Okay. Couple things to notice here. Uh, first of all, this is tight. You can construct examples where it achieves exactly 2 minus 1 over m. Um, we had no idea of the optimum schedule. We just used these two naive lower bounds. Uh, we used a greedy strategy, right? Um, but if you want to think about an example where we end up with this 2 minus 1 over m case, how, how do you trick the algorithm into, into doing this uh, very far from optimum thing? Well, if you look back at our proof, the problem arose when this final job that got added was very big. And that's exactly how you trip up the algorithm. You give it tons and tons of tiny little jobs, which it happily spreads out evenly over all of the machines. And then after you've piled up enough height on all of the different machines, you give it one great big job. <coughs> what should that algorithm have done? Yeah? Oh, it should have sorted the um, jobs by the first. Well, in this particular case, what should it have, what, what, what's, a, what's an optimum schedule here? Yeah? 
redistribute the short jobs to the other machines. Yeah, move the short stuff over here and give this big job a whole thing for itself, right? And if you think about it, that's putting sort of an extra 1 over m a little bit onto all of these, which is where the minus 1 over m comes from in the bound, OK? But you pointed out the sort of the fix for this. The reason that this happened was that the big job landed last. And you can prove that if you put the jobs on in decreasing order of size, then you do much better. But there's an advantage to this approach, which is that it is entirely online. It doesn't require any knowledge of what's going to happen. And at every moment in time, it is within a factor two of the optimum solution, no matter what's coming later. And that's very useful. And when we study online algorithms in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. But next time, we'll look at refining uh, several of these algorithms to get better approximation bounds.